hi guys i'm back again today with another video this is another video on the mega projects the world tallest bridge so yesterday we did the bridge from sweden to denmark the orson or song uh, bridge and this is now Melo viaduct anyways uh before we do start off we can subscribe click the bell button and let's get it i wonder where this is you buy squarespace from websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online print more about them in a bit In the early 1960s, a cynical British commentator remarked that a motorway could be defined as the shortest distance between two traffic jams, and that cynical dude was absolutely correct. In the 1980s, France had a slightly different problem. Two motorways from opposite directions leading to the same traffic jam, Mio. Situated at the bottom of one of the deepest valleys in Europe, the medieval town, the center of the ceramics trade in Roman times and with its roots back in the Bronze Age, must have always been a difficult place to get to, through or round. In the 20th century, it was on the most popular holiday route in the country, Paris to the Mediterranean, and regularly it suffered five or six hour traffic jams throughout July and August. The high-speed routes to the north and south stopped short of the chasm that was the Tan Valley. How to bridge the gap occupied the minds of planners, engineers, and architects for the best part of two decades. Four possible routes were considered. The road could bypass Mio to the east, crossing the Tarn and the Doubi rivers on to very high bridges with spans of 800 and 1,000 meters respectively. These posed technical problems, but the main objection to this route was that Mio would basically be virtually cut off from the outside world. A bypass to the west was technically easier, but more expensive and 12 kilometers longer. The main drawback to this solution was the adverse impact on the environment, a factor that was particularly important considering the spectacular beauty of this area. A third suggested route was rejected because of its possible impact on future plans for the area, leaving the fourth possibility also to the west of Mew, crossing not only the river but the entire valley of the Tarn as the preferred route. This could be accomplished in one of two ways, a descent into the valley followed by a bridge, a viaduct and a tunnel, or the seemingly impossible, a 2.5 kilometer long viaduct more than 200 meters above the river. They chose the impossible. Fresh from the success of his Pont de Normandie, at the time the longest cable stayed bridge in the world, Dr. Michel Villago had ambitious plans for Milo. While the Normandy Bridge had cable stays on both sides of the road deck, his concept for this viaduct had just one central set of stays and would be carried by not two, but nine piers right across the valley from the plateau on one side to the plateau on the other. Unwilling to take a chance on one man's ideas, the French Roads Administration announced a competition for architects and engineers to come up with a practical design. By July 1993, the applications by 17 engineers and 38 architects had been whittled down to eight structural engineers and seven architects to study the problem. Between them and an independent panel of experts, they came up with five general design ideas by February 1995. The competition was relaunched with five engineering slash architectural partnerships doing in-depth studies of the selected approaches to the problem. And in July of 1996, the multiple span cable stayed viaduct proposed by the structural engineering group Sogerlerg, Europe Etudes, Getze and Surf with British architect Lord Norman Foster was selected. Foster had taken Villago's concept even further further into the realms of the impossible by cutting the number of piers to seven and making them even slimmer. The basis of his thinking was to take an inventive piece of engineering and turn it into a work of art, something that would appear to rest lightly on the incredible mountain landscape. That's crazy. Look at how... The next two and a half years saw Beautiful extensive studies being made so the intricate details of the design could be finalized. A geological survey showed that the fractured limestone coupled with a myriad of caves in the area might pose a problem in the form of landslides, while an 18-month meteorological study showed that the winds being funneled through the gorge could gust up to 130 kilometers an hour. 
hurricane forces. Wind tunnels led to alterations in the shape of the road deck and some detailed corrections being made to the shape of the pylons, but by late 1998, the final design was approved. The project went out to tender in 1999 and was awarded to, and uh, my French pronunciation I know, Compagnie Effage du Viaduc de Milo. Now, all they had to do was build the tallest bridge piers in the world and put a 36,000 ton freeway on top of them. No worries. Oh, and that was just for starters. Then they had to erect seven steel pylons, each weighing 700 tons, and secure the road deck with 5,000 tons of pre stressed steel cabling. And they had to do it in under four years or face a fine of $30,000 a day for late delivery. Even some of the engineers on the project had their doubts. Two weeks after the laying of the first stone on December the 14th, 2001, the workers started digging the shafts for the pilings, four to each pier, 15 meters deep and five meters in diameter. The footings on top of the concrete pilings took another 2,000 cubic meters of concrete, and now progress began to show above the ground. Now, back to our video in just a moment, but first, a word from today's video sponsor, Squarespace. Right now, it's the age of creation. I'm so Got a great sorry. idea. Squares screen Squares in front of you case. you like maybe so fantastic there's no technical nonsense to worry focused on the content and not and some of the colors there are so many extra tools social you need in oh my God, all if it involves so a long. Web trial and when you're ready to launch your new website or a domain and let's get back to the video Every three days, each pier grew by four meters. Then, because of the tapering design of the piers, the 15-ton mold had to be taken down and adjusted for the next pour. The concrete was being manufactured on site, so a new layer could be poured every 20 minutes, and the speed of construction increased rapidly. Mm -hmm. Now, it was during this phase that geologists' fears were realized. A violent storm caused a landslide, and 4,000 cubic meters of rock were dislodged near the first pier. Fortunately, the pier wasn't damaged, but manpower had to be diverted to stabilize stabilizing the grounds, and time was of the essence. Construction continued, with each team aiming its pier to an exact point in the sky. With no visual reference as to whether the piers were straight, the engineers relied on GPS, using multiple satellite feeds to pinpoint the destination of the build. By November 2003, the piers had reached their full height a month ahead of schedule, and accurate to within two centimeters. Meanwhile, the steel company, Eiffel, founded by Gustave Eiffel of Eiffel Tower fame, was manufacturing the steel it's road a, deck. The 2,200 separate sections, each weighing up to 90 tons and some as long as 22 meters, then had to be transported hundreds of kilometers by road and welded together on site. The plan was to slide the two colossal sections across the piers from either side of the valley so they would meet in the middle. I don't understand. But okay. I trust you. <laughs> to stop the leading edge from dipping and knocking down the piers, one of the pylons was installed on each section to hold the cable stays mm. supporting the front of the deck. Temporary steel support towers were then placed at each halfway point between the piers to make the distance between them more manageable. Even so, the road deck would still have to be launched over greater distances than had ever been done before. Also, simply launching the sections over the edge by pushing them with hydraulic jacks was not going to work in the case of such enormous sections. The jacks would need a considerable amount of help along the way. The engineers designed a novel system of pairs of hydraulically driven wedges, four sets of which were installed on top of each pier. The upper and lower wedge of each pair pointed in opposite directions. Yeah. Controlled by a computer so that they acted in perfect unison, the lower wedges were to slide Even under the Even if I was smart, or... right? And I know the people who come up with this are not necessarily constructing is because we have constructors or engineers who do those but even if i was doing any of those work that has to like go up into those like cranes and what what not i'll shiz myself okay i'm gonna shiz myself if i did because i'm not good with heights if i was smart to do any of those jobs cannot find me up there high enough to lift the road deck off of its supports. Both wedges would then slide forward, moving mm. the deck forward. The lower wedges would then return to their starting positions, followed by the upper wedges, leaving the deck 600 mm its journey. Then the four-minute cycle would be repeated. No launch had ever been done this way before, and there was no chance to test the system. It just had to work. And it is. 
and everything went smoothly until six months into the launch when one of the launch systems failed. To make what matters worse, the meteorologists were predicting a storm and the deck was in a vulnerable position with its leading edge hanging out into space. The engineers had underestimated the friction between the sliding surfaces of the wedges and the non-stick PTFE coating which had worn away. There were no spare parts for this impromptu design, but there were as yet unused pairs of wedges which were destined for the piers that had yet to be reached by the advancing deck. The team hastily stripped them of their coating and repaired the damaged units while the weathermen chewed their nails and monitored the impending storm. Disaster had just been averted. The deck reached its next support safely. The person was to Over test, months, like, the two sections driving from one end to other as each reached its for the first support. time. The teams breathed a collective Scary. sigh of relief and checked the weather forecast before pushing on to the next stage. Things were going well, but there was still no guarantee that the two sides would meet in the right place. Even the mm. slightest inaccuracy could mean that they'd built the most expensive white elephant in Europe. The engineers installed a GPS system on the leading edge of the section that was to make the final push so they could compare the actual position with their calculations. Smart. They now approached the most difficult part of the launch, bridging the river itself. Not only was this the longest span of the viaduct, but it was also the one place where it had been impossible to erect any intermediate supports. The leading edge of the longer section launched across 342 meters of open space, and the teams held their breath as the suspense mounted, and the French Prime Minister was also due to drop by to see the event. No pressure. As the edges got closer together, the tension eased. It looked as if it would be a near-perfect fit. A magnum of champagne was positioned at the point of contact, and as it exploded, other corks were popped. Celebrations were in order because the discrepancy in the alignment was a matter of millimeters. Of course, the project was nowhere near complete, but the first two major challenges, the piers and the road deck, had been successfully navigated, and they were still on schedule. Because steel is flexible, more so than some of them had realized, the road deck had an undulating appearance at this stage that was a bit of a cause for worry. Would the cable stays pull it straight, or had they run across another unexpected problem? Before that question could be answered, the remaining five pylons had to be erected. These 700-ton steel monsters had to be raised through 90 degrees and accurately positioned on top of the piers. To achieve this, they borrowed a 2,000-year-old technique from the ancient Egyptians, who had used it to erect obelisks and piers at Karnak. While the Egyptians would have used slaves as their motive power, the 21st century engineers had the advantage of hydraulics to lift this massive weight. The principle was straightforward, as Archimedes summed it up. Give me a lever long enough on a fulcrum and I'll move the world. On top of the road deck, the team put up two enormous towers, secured by cables and equipped with a hydraulic system capable of raising a thousand tons. As the hydraulics lifted each pylon, it pivoted slowly until it was vertical and could be lowered safely onto its anchoring point. With all seven pylons in place, the team attached the cables which supported the deck. As the tension on the cables increased, so the kinks in the road deck smoothed out and another challenge had been met. There just remained the finishing touches. The road surface added 10,000 tons to the weight of the deck, and just to be sure it was safe, they drove 36 monster trucks with a combined weight of over 900 tons onto the longest span. The distortion was negligible. On December 14, 2004, President Jacques Chirac formally opened the viaduct, and it opened to traffic two days later. This was almost a month ahead of schedule. Mm -mm. The construction of the Minoa Viaduct broke several records. Two of the piers were the highest in the world. The pylon on top of the second pier was the highest bridge tower in the world. At 270 meters above the town, the road deck was almost twice the height of the previous European record holders. Critics of the project had said that the technical difficulties would be insurmountable and the whole scheme was doomed to fail. And they were proved very wrong. Others said that tourists would avoid the bridge rather than pay the toll fee. The project would never break even and toll income would never amortize the initial investment and the contractor would have to be supported by subsidies. They would be proved wrong the following summer. The Minot Viaduct was an instant success and at the height of the tourist season carried more than 60,000 vehicles per day. At €8.30 wow. per vehicle, the viaduct would pay for itself in less than three years. 
So I really hope you found this video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. And as always, wow. thank you for watching. These are fascinating. I didn't even know like half of these bridges exist in the world and how they come to be. I, I mean, my thinking is I just wake up one day and God made a bridge. Yeah, that's where my mind went. I know it's human beings, but in my head, right, it's like magic, you know, like there's a wand, maybe the president of the country just sh shakes his wands and then just that and then the bridge comes to to be like i don't necessarily go into depth when i see a bridge right i'm not like sitting there like who did this how many people how long did it take like it's never something that i think about but watching this i'm just so mind blown like actual human beings are that smart to come together and create such beauty and something that is really like going to benefit the people props to you that is uh, so fascinating so anyways thank you guys for joining and i'll see you guys on monday bye